don't know how to communicate with real people. They know how to communicate with each other, and that's about as far as it goes. So that what Fred did was we would come into Maury, sit down, order our drinks, and he would throw a Supreme Court decision on the table. And he would say, you see this decision? I want you back here next Friday, right, having rewritten this in English. And that was the hardest job of any course at Yale Law School, was to take opinions which went on for pages, with footnotes that went on for even more pages, with legal jargon uh, interspersed with just adjectives, and try to make that into English so that people who were not lawyers could understand what these decisions meant. I would not have really gotten as much out of that course if I hadn't had a liberal arts education at Cornell. And that's what Fred was after, the idea that it's not enough simply to absorb information or even to spout it back and get good grades. You have to be able to use that information and find out how to communicate it best to people who are not necessarily like you. And I'll come back. Uh, I'm supposed to be giving you some amusing stories, so I'm going to try, but I will come back to that issue before I stop. Anyway, after Yale, I was chosen to be the fellow of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, which is the New York City Bar Association, full of very distinguished lawyers and very distinguished judges. And I was very excited because here I would be dealing with these immense people. And most of the time I ended up getting taxi cabs for drunken judges after dinners at the Bar Association. And I became very good at that. And it also motivated me to write an article for the Bar Association Journal called The Legal the legal addition, uh, addiction of the alcohol addict. And I had a lot of experience watching these judges, and I wrote a pretty good article. We also got involved at a later point with the Civil Rights passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which was a major, you know, profitable time, short as it was in my life, being involved with helping to get that law passed. After that, I got a job in one of the most interesting law firms in New York called Greenbaum, Wolf & Ernst. One of the partners, Morris Ernst, had been one of the founders of the American Civil Liberties Union and was the lawyer for Margaret Sanger when she found Planned Parenthood. And Morris, I immediately glommed on to Morris as my mentor, which he accepted gladly. However, being a liberal arts major at Cornell, I was not destined to sit behind the desk for very long and write legal memos. After six months at the law firm, Morris came into my office one day and said, um, look, I think I need you to take a leave of absence from the law firm. And I said, Morris, I just joined the law firm. How do you want me to take a leave of absence? He said, well, I'm taking on a case, very unpopular, and the firm doesn't want me to take it, so I've decided to take a little bit from the firm, and we're going to just get an office uptown in New York and set up our own operation, and when we're over, we'll come back. So I said, well, what's this all about? And he said, well, there was this professor at Columbia. Actually, he was only an assistant professor named Galindas. This was 1957. And he was standing on the street corner of 111th Street Broadway one night, and he was kidnapped. And he disappeared. And Life Magazine published a huge article saying that he was kidnapped by the dictator of the Dominican Republic, Trujillo, <coughs> who took him to, to <coughs> the Dominican Republic and had him killed because he was a supporter and in fact the leader of a group that wanted to overthrow Trujillo and that therefore Trujillo was guilty of this crime. 
And I said, Morris, it's all over Life magazine. Everybody's been, it's been on television. What are we going to do? Why are we doing this? He said, well, you know and I know that no one is guilty until they've been proven guilty. Do you call this proof? And he threw this article at me, and I read it, and I said, no, it's not proof, it's surmise. He said, that's why we're taking this on. We're going to find out whether it's true or not. We're going to publish our findings, and then we're going to come back and work for the law firm. So I said, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this. I've only been here six months, you know, uh, thinking to myself, you know, they're going to hate me here. And, uh, but he said, look, he said, you know, what ears are for to get ears are for to be pinned back. He said, you're going to get your ears pinned back, but you're going to learn a lot. So I finally said yes, and we moved out. We moved it to some fairly dingy offices. We hired an ex-police captain. God knows why he was ex, probably for alcohol reasons. And a couple of other pseudo-investigators and a girlfriend I was going out with who happened to be full in Spanish. So that all worked out. And, um, <laughs> We got involved in trying to track what happened to Galindez. We got a lot of people saying he was seen at the airport in uh, East Hampton. He was saying, I have his thumb. His thumb, thumb was cut off, and I'll sell it to you for $20,000. A lot of things that you will now see on the internet, we didn't have the internet, we had phones, people were calling. One day, Morris invited me for lunch at this very rinsy restaurant. New York. Whenever he did that, I knew something was going to happen, which he wanted me to do, and I wasn't going to be absolutely certain about it. And he said, listen, he said, I need you to go to Havana. So I said, Havana? You mean Cuba? He said, yeah, Cuba. Well, Cuba at that time was before um, Fidel Castro. In fact, Castro was a guerrilla in the mountains the Sierra Maestro Mountains, and another horrible dictator, Batista, was sitting running Cuba. And I said, well, what am I going to do in Cuba? He said, well, there was a report that this guy who supposedly flew Galindez to the Dominican Republic actually landed in Havana. And there's a record in the office of the secret police said, the Cuban secret police? He said, yeah. There's a record in there that uh, this guy, Murphy, landed in Havana and didn't leave until the next day, so he couldn't have taken Galinda as the Dominican Republic. So I go down there and get that record. <laughs> so I said, Mars, I've never been to Cuba. I don't speak Spanish. What are you, what are you asking me to do? He said, don't worry. He said, Someone is going to meet you there. <laughs> Someone is going to meet you there. He said, yeah. And this guy knows all the ropes. And I said, what is his name? And he said, all I can tell you is he has three names. <laughs> Flores, Fogarty, and Friedman. So I said, Flores, Fogarty, and Friedman. I figured that one out. And uh, I said, where is he going to meet me? He said, at the bar at the Hotel Nacional in Havana. <coughs> so, listen, I was a liberal arts major. I got on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I flew to Havana and checked into my room, went down to the bar, which was, in those days, full of American gamblers like Meyer Lansky. George Raft, the actor, was in there. And I had no idea what Flores Fogarty Friedman looked like or who he was. All of a sudden, a guy comes up to me and he said, hi. He said, my name is Fogarty. I said, oh, really? Where is Flores and Friedman? And he smiled, sort of. And he said, look, he said, you're going to need me here. He said, my I said, uh, who do you work for? He said, I work for the Central Intelligence Agency. But don't worry because, you know, I used to 
be down here all the time. I actually ran the Caribbean section for a while. But I think you ought to realize you're going to need someone who can translate for you. So it'll be me. And I said, well, what do I say to people, whoever they may be? And he said, well, why don't you just say I'm a businessman who's a friend of yours and I speak Spanish, so you've asked me to come along. So I said, OK. I got back to my room wondering who was going to call and what was going to happen. The phone rings, literally in about a half hour. And a voice appears, it sounds British, maybe Australian. And the voice says, hello. And I said, who's this? And he said, it doesn't matter who this is. He says, but I want you to listen to me very carefully. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, you're going to be picked up in a black Cadillac. No, not black, blue Cadillac. And take, take it to where it is you have to go. And I said, oh, OK. And um, what do I do then? He said, we'll be in touch. So I call up Flores Fogarty, Friedman. And I, he's in another room. And I tell him I'm being picked up at 11. He said, oh, that's fine. We'll be in the lot. 11 o'clock. Guy arrives, rather large Mexican guy, and asks for me, and I come out, and he looks around, and there's Flores Fogarty, Friedman, and he says, who is this? And I said, well, this is my friend, the businessman. I can't speak Spanish. I'm sorry. And then they start talking. He doesn't look happy, but we get into the car. We're driven to the offices of the secret police. That was something. There are these pink buildings. They were, anyway. Maybe they're still there. They didn't have Anna, which looked like either a villa you know, of a billionaire or else a fortress. And this was a fortress with guys with machine guns walking around, submachine guns, outside. And the reason for that was, and I found that out the night before in the hotel, <clears throat> a week before, Castro's guys had burned all the commercial paper in the bank of Havana. And two weeks before, they had kidnapped an Italian, famous Italian racing driver named Fangio. And Castro was coming out of the Sierra Maestro Mountains. He had just started to move out of his army. And they were shooting in the, lobby, in the plaza before the Hotel Nacional. You could hear machine guns going off. And people were driving around in jeeps with machine guns going after some of Castro's supporters. So it was extremely tense. And I was absolutely nonplussed. I was, I think, too surprised to be shocked or horrified or scared, but it was getting to me. Anyway, we drove to the offices of the secret police. We get out, Flores Fogarty and I, and I'm met by some captain, and we're told to wait somewhere in this convert, uh, Karen's building. And we are sitting down there, and the guy comes up, and uh, he's got a holster and a gun, and he's sitting down, and I hear screams from behind this wall. And I said to Flores Fogarty Friedman, what, what's going on there? And he said, you know, they're beating, they're beating the crap out of these Castro guys back there. And then he's talking, he started to talk to this low-level guy sitting next to us, who was a guard or something. And they were talking about boxing, some kind of boxing match. I didn't understand any of it. By this time, I was getting scared. And this guy starts to you know, do boxing motions, and he has his gun in his hand. And Flores Fogarty starts ducking. And he grabs me, and he says, get down, get down. And I said, why? He said, well, the safety is off that gun. <laughs> so I got down. Anyway, a, a captain comes and escorts me back to the files, shows me a file that's not the right Murphy, not the right pilot. I told him that. He was very angry. We went back, and they told us to leave, that they would try to find the right file. Went back to the hotel, called 
my mentor, Morris Ernst, who had told me if there was any issue, we should talk in code. I said, what do you mean, Morris? What kind of code? He said, well, <laughs> think of it this way. We're working on a divorce case. We represent the wife. You're down in Havana trying to get evidence about the husband's financial dealings. Got that? So if you have to call me, you call me and just say, you know, I, I got to talk to you about the wife and, and try to make that work. I said, okay, fine. So here I am. I don't know what happened with this guy at the Cuban secret police. I get back. I pick up the phone. I call Morris in New York. I said, Morris, he said, what do you want? I said, um, Morris, you know about the divorce case? He said, what divorce case? What are you talking about? <laughs> so I said, you know, the wife, the wife I'm down here, he said, look, I've got a pit meeting coming up. Can you please tell me what's going on? So I told him, he said, don't leave. That's his only, don't leave. I go back, I get a call from the first caller, the Australian guy. All he says is, um, you made a cock up of that, didn't you? I said, I didn't make a cock up of anything. I didn't get the file. He said, well, my suggestion is you leave immediately on the next plane. I said, why? He said, because you're going to be kidnapped. And I said, who's going to kidnap me? You know, I'm 24 years old. I don't know anybody here. Who's going to kidnap me? <laughs> he said, Castro's guy's going to kidnap you. I said, no, I don't believe it. So I hang up the phone, and I go to FFF's room, right? <laughs> and I say, um, I just had this weird call. And he said, what was it? I said, they say I'm going to be kidnapped. And um, he said, well, yeah, we better get out of here. We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here tonight. So I said, we just got here. He said, I know, we got to get out. He starts packing. And he actually said this line. I know I should have brought my Smith and Wesson 38. <laughs> I said this line, I said to myself, I know I should not have brought myself. <laughs> <laughs> I go back up, I have to call Morris. I call Morris, I say, Morris, I got a call saying that I'm going to be kidnapped. He said, don't leave. <laughs> I'll call you back. An hour later, two Bloody Marys later, he calls him back. He said, yeah, get out of there. Get out of there. <laughs> so Floris Fogarty and I, he had booked, Floris Fogarty had booked two. Somehow he got two seats on the last play now. And we went back, flew back to New York. I got to see Morris at that same fancy restaurant the next day. Sure enough, he shows me a... Well, we had telegrams in those days. You know what they looked like? Yeah. He showed me a telegram saying, your man in Havana, not that, he said, your associate in Havana will be kidnapped by whatever time. So there I was, out of there. We later found out that the CIA's purpose in being there was not at all to protect me, but it was to make sure that I did not get the right file, because in fact, the CIA had been running Melendez, who in fact was the head of the vast Republican government in exile, and the CIA was getting ready to try to get rid of Franco, and this guy was a key operative to have that happen. And he was, I don't know what happened to him, he was never found again, but that was a lesson. The lesson in that was, <laughs> Don't believe everything that is said to you or even happens to you. <laughs> I then went into a period of some more safety, but not a lot. I started to represent a lot of writers, and you know writers. Some of them are the most dangerous people in the world, <laughs> particularly after a few drinks. And <laughs> I ended up writing people, uh, representing people like Tennessee Williams, John Cheever, and um, Bell Brooks, well, other people. I became counsel of the Association of American Publishers, counsel of the Penn Writers Association. I got involved 
with all sorts of good, interesting activities for a lawyer who was very interested in writers, writers, playwrights, and so on. When one day, 10 years later, after this wonderful experience in Havana, I was sitting in my apartment with my wife, then wife and two little kids, two and four, and I got another call, not from Morris, but from another partner, General Greenbaum. General Greenbaum was almost as close as Morris. He had been in the second jeep into Berlin after the First World War for the American Army, and he had been in the second jeep into Berlin after the Second World War, and he was then the ambassador of the United Nations from our country. He called and he said, Alan, are you sitting down? I said, yes. He said, um, Can you, is your passport in order? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, um, can you leave tonight? We're getting on a plane tonight. So I said, where are we going, Eddie? And he said, I can't tell you that. <laughs> and I said, why are we going, Eddie? And he said, we're going to help a lady in distress. <laughs> so I said, we're going to help a lady in distress. How long are we going to be gone? He said, I don't know. So I packed the bag, said goodbye to my questioning wife, kissed my kids, got into a helicopter, got to, we had helicopters on the Pan Am building in those days until one crashed later, got to the airport, flew to uh, Milan with General Greenbaum. And we got to Milan at five o'clock in the morning, we were sitting in the cafeteria in the airport, and a guy is sitting there. Look familiar. I said, Eddie, who's that? He said, that's George Kennan, the former ambassador to Moscow. I said, yeah, I thought so. He said, you know, he's a neighbor of mine. So I said, in Princeton. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah, well, George asked me to asked us me to come here and I'm 70 years old and I needed you. Okay. Uh, what are we here for? Well, turns out that Stalin's daughter, so Russia was still very communist in those days. Stalin's daughter has defected from the Soviet Union in India. I said, well, that's interesting, isn't it? He said, yeah, and she's in Switzerland now, and that's where we're going. And I said, we're going to Switzerland? He said, yeah. We talked to George Kennan, who said, I'm going back to, uh, to uh, Princeton. Uh, you're here on your own. The United States government has no interest in you being here and will deny that you have anything to do with them. And I said, I have nothing to do with them. <laughs> I've never even been in the army. And uh, he said, well, you're going to be driven through the Simplon Tunnel to Bern, Switzerland, and you'll take it from there. She's in Switzerland somewhere. And Eddie said, well, how did you get to Switzerland? And he said, well, she was flown to Rome by the CIA. The Russians were hysterical. They wanted to get her. It was the biggest black mark on the Soviet Union, you know, since Lenin. And they have to get her back, and they're going to kill anybody who's in the way. So they flew her to Rome. They didn't know what to do with her because the United States government did not want to recognize that they had her in their possession. And they kept her in a CIA safe house. They flew her to, they tried to land in Geneva. There were too many reporters around. Everybody knew that she had defected. Um, so they landed in an airport outside of Bern. And she was staying somewhere in the countryside. And we got to Bern, we got to, we wanted to stay, I wanted to stay at this great hotel I heard about. No, no, we couldn't do that because it was full of reporters. So that we stayed at some modest hotel, and Eddie said, and I said, uh, what do we do now? And he said, well, they're going to take us to see her. And I said, well, what does she want? He 
said, well, fine, how will I get there? So he said, but I'm going to call the ambassador. He's a friend of mine here in Bern. And uh, we'll get the kind of comfort we need about who's backing up what. He called, tries to call the ambassador. The ambassador won't take his call. And all of a sudden, he realizes that we are on our own with 400 reporters all around us. And Svetlana, that was Svetlana Alleluia, that was her maiden name, uh, mother's name, uh, is somewhere in the countryside. We're, got, we, we're taken to see her at night. This woman, this red-haired woman, is there. And some other people, one of them is the head of the Swiss Foreign Office for East Europe, who, who became somebody I could trust and a couple of other guys that looked like they were from the CIA, and, uh, but they weren't supposed to be there, according to them. And uh, she was there. She wanted two things. She wanted to make a will, because she was sure she was going to be killed. She had two grown children in Russia. And she wanted someone to take the manuscript she had written in secret get it published in the West. And it was called 20 Letters to a Friend. And that's all we know about it. So Eddie said, well, we could do a will right now. We'll do a holographic will. So he did that. And then she, he said, well, you can give this young man, that was me in those days, the manuscript, which was in Russia. And uh, he'll take it out of here. So he said, well, what would you like to do with yourself now? She said, I would like to come to America. And he said, you know, the United States government cannot recognize that it has anything to do with you and your defection. So you are going to be subject to people like us. You're going to have to trust us. And she said, oh, I, that's fine. I will. She spoke really much. And then he said something that surprised even me, or particularly me. He said, how would you like this nice young man to come and bring you back to America? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I looked at him. And she said, oh, that would be wonderful. Well, that's what happened. Months later, and I'm going to make this one short because I want to get on to something a little funnier even, maybe. Uh, Months later, I took a secret trip again, this time to Frankfurt, changing planes, changing stations, got on a train to Basel, thinking everybody around me was there to come. Everybody I thought was a Russian agent. Of course, they were not. They were professors. They were, I don't know who they were. Anyway, I got off at Basel, was driven by a secret police to Zurich. So I spent a lot of there, had dinner with her, we got up the next morning at a motel. A whole bevy of secret, Swiss secret police surrounded me, brought me to her. We got on a Swiss airplane. Everybody was talking about what happened to Svetlana Stalin, this and that. We were sitting there in first class having martinis. <laughs> She had never had one, but she certainly needed one and made her feel better at me, too. <laughs> and um, drove, flew back to America, except that the Russians found out about the fact that the United States knew about where she was and hadn't told them, and they were kind of upset. And they hadn't also they hadn't told the pilot on the airplane either who she was. We were traveling under false passports. Anyway, we got back. There were 4,000 people at Kennedy Airport in those days, Idlewild Airport. No, Kennedy, I guess then. And that was the beginning of my relationship, not only with Svetlana, who I had a relationship for many years and write to her, and she writes to me even now, but also with a lot of other Russian defectors and writers like Solzhenitsyn, who's uh, four of whose books I had translated in Europe and published around Europe and around the world while he was still in the Gulag. 
So I got very involved with the Russian funnel of people before communism fell. However, going back to um, what else I did, in other words, what I did for a living, when I was not running around, uh, I was back to the days when I was a really young lawyer, sitting in my little office, and Morris came in and said, you know, have you ever heard of a guy named Mel Brooks? And I said, no, no. He said, well, he did some television stuff, and he just had a play on Broadway which failed called All American. And we're handling a divorce from him, but he doesn't have any money. But he keeps talking about wanting to do something called springtime for Hitler. <laughs> and I don't know what he wants to do, but you know, you take care of him. We're, we're dealing with a divorce, you deal with it. So this guy comes in, he's about this tall, right? And uh, he sits down in my office, which about filled up the office. And he said, oh, Alan, he said, I heard about you. I hear you're really good on this kind of, I said, well, you know, I started practice a year ago. I'm getting there. And uh, he said, well, I have this idea for a dramatic play. I said, what's it called? He said, springtime for Hitler. I said, springtime for Hitler. I said, what is it about? He said, well, it's a play. It sort of tries to make fun about Adolf Hitler, but it's not a comedy. <laughs> so really, he said, yeah. He said, look, I'm working on it. You seem like you're interested in stuff like this. And I said, yeah, I have a liberal arts degree. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, he said, I'll bring it in next time. Is two weeks okay? We can even have lunch. Lunch? No one ever asked me to lunch. I generally either didn't have lunch or had a sandwich. He said, yeah, I'll pick you up at 1 o'clock. So two weeks go by, he picks me up. And he's carrying a bag, a paper bag. And he said, uh, can I sit down here? I said, sure. He said, he opens the bag, and that's his lunch. He, there was a place across the street called Chock Full of Nuts that used to be a franchise in New York. And he used to go there and get a container of tea and a walnut and cheese, cream cheese sandwich. So he opens it up. He had a napkin too, which was nice. And, uh, we had lunch. I watched him have lunch. <laughs> Delivered the first draft of this serious play about Adolf Hitler, which actually was called Springtime for Hitler by Mel Brooks. So I went home and I read it, and I read it, and I said, uh, they're going to lock him up. He's nuts. <laughs> I said, they're going to have to lock him up. So I went in to see Morris, and I said, Morris, I don't know what to do with this guy. He's written a play called Spring. I said, I told you. It was so Mel came back, Mel called and said, uh, by the way, he said, I've decided to make it into a comedy. I said, oh, really? Spent time for Hitler, a comedy, okay. And I'll have the new draft in another two weeks, he said. But I'll come to your office. <coughs> two weeks later, I'm walking into my office. And my office, as you may imagine, was the smallest office down a long corridor in this library. And as I'm walking down, since nothing I did was private, no one else considered anything I did private, the door was open. And I'm walking down the corridor, and I see Mel sitting behind my desk. <laughs> and as I walk more closely, closely, the phone rings. Hit my phone. <laughs> and I see him picking up my phone, and he looks up and he sees me, and as I'm walking into the office, he said, no, madam, we do not handle million-dollar estates. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? He said, oh, some very rich woman, but she sounded very cranky. I didn't think you wanted to talk. <laughs> well, that was the beginning of the producers. And I have to 
cut the producers a little short to tell you that Mel finally wrote something called Springtime Italy. That was a comedy. We went to see the greatest producer of movies at that time, jo Joseph E. Levine, who produced The Graduate. That was the last film he made. The Longest Day, everything. And Mel jumped around with Joe Levine, playing all the characters, and actually got Joe Levine to say, OK, I'll make it. How much will it cost? Now, Mel Brooks had never made a movie. Alan Schwartz had never represented anybody who had made a movie. I had no idea what this movie would cost or anything. But in two seconds, Mel said, $920,000. Joe said, OK, but you have to change the name. Nobody will go to see a, museum, a comedy called, a musical comedy called Springtime for Hitler. So anyway, we made the producer, he used him as a name, for $920,000. He didn't pay the actors anything. He shot part of it in the basement of Lincoln Center. And it became not a major financial success, but a major artistic in kind of success with everybody. It later became the musical of the producers, which became a huge financial success. And I am still representing Mel Brooks after all those years. Um, so what that says to me is, if I were one of these guys who had gone to a trade school, or I thought all my life, my father was a lawyer, a very poor lawyer, poor in the sense of financially, without any money. If I had gone to school just to become a lawyer, I probably would not have been interested in, or sympathetic to, or even understanding anything what this little about what this little sort of beat up comic was going to do. Together with Mel, together with my help, and Bate has made 22 movies. Not all of them are comedies. There's 84 Charing Cross Road, The Elephant Man, uh, Francis, The Fly, all of which Mel produced. And he has become, you know, a major fixture in the American cinema. So I now will jump to, ah, he gave me parts in two movies. That. My first part was in a movie called High Anxiety, with somebody you might have seen. And he decided I would play a psychiatrist at a psychiatrist's convention. So I was sitting right where Chris was sitting, surrounded by actors in a suit. And I didn't have any lines, of course. But I was trying to react to what Mel, who was standing where I'm standing, was saying to the psychiatric convention. So I was doing things like <laughs> <laughs> We had a break. He then broke. And I ran up to him and I said, Mel, Mel, give me some directions. What should I do? And he said, cut out the facial crap. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first movie. And you can see me. And it's great too. I had the last credit. You know where the credits are? The last credit. If you stayed awake long enough, the stayed in the theater was psychiatrist, Alan U. Schwartz. <laughs> See? Another liberal arts to do. <laughs> My other film was History of the World, Part One. I don't know if I've ever seen that. There was a section on the Roman Empire. And in this, I, was, I had my own trailer. He gave me my own trailer. I had this, I was in a toga. I was playing. I was in the center. And I was, sitting on my toga looking at myself in these mirrors and with all these little lights they have. And uh, somebody knocks on the door, the door opens, this pretty little girl comes in and she's carrying one of these paint sprayers and she looks at me and she said, would you mind picking up your skirts? And I said, what? She said, pick up your skirts. So I up my skirts and she sprayed me so I looked tan because of course all Roman senators were tan. <laughs> and I did have a line. See? It was in Latin. 
Well, one was in, yes, it was in Latin. Uh, we were walking down the forum to the forum, and I was standing next to a guy who was a major comedian. And I said to him, E pluribus unum, <laughs> sic transit gloria. And he said to me, I didn't know Gloria was sick. <laughs> that was my first and only time playing a straight man. <laughs> so I was in that. And then one day, my wife Louise and I were driving down Sunset Boulevard as I moved to California, following Mel and various other people. We're driving down Sunset Boulevard. and almost had an accident because we looked up and there was a billboard, huge. And it says, Spaceballs, may the Schwartz be with you. <laughs> so Mellon decided to not put me in Spaceballs, which made me feel pretty rotten. But I didn't realize what he really had on his mind. So the Schwartz was with him. And it was unbelievable. And it's still, as you can imagine, wherever I go, people are like, oh, they don't care anything about what else I've done. I could have been killed in Havana. I could have been killed by the Russians. Are you the Schwartz from May the Schwartz be with you? <laughs> that was Mel. No, that is Mel. No. I'm going to briefly mention uh, one other client who has meant a great deal to me, and that is my late good friend and client, Truman Capote. <clears throat> I met Truman in 1969 after he published In Cold Blood, after he had given this great ball at the Plaza Hotel, the black and white ball. I met him after all that. And I started to represent him. And somehow or other, this little guy with this high voice and I really communicated. Liberal arts degree. And Truman and I became good friends. He was gay, and he was outwardly gay, and he used to come and have dinner with my little kids and my wife. And um, He was not afraid to be anything. He was not afraid to be gay. He was not afraid to be small. He was not afraid to be odd looking. He was not afraid to have his little voice up there with a lisp on it. And that's one reason why I admire him so much, aside from the fact that he's one of the great prose writers in the English language. And anyway, however, he had his own views of things. So a couple of years after I started to represent him, I was at a fancy dinner party with him. Henry Kissinger was sitting there. Lee Roswell was sitting there, and all these people. And these very rich people, and he was sitting next to him. What I thought then was matronly woman. Now I think she's probably young, but she looked matronly. And I was sitting there talking to somebody, having a glass of wine. And I heard him say to this woman in his loud voice, well, if you have Alan Schwartz, you don't need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and then I realized it was a real compliment. Now what he was saying is that people like me can understand people like him and that I basically could take care of the things that he couldn't take care of. And for him to say you don't need a lawyer meant that I was somebody he did understand. And that phrase has meant a great deal to me as I've thought about my, my, uh, my life in the law and my life and also the world of the arts and to some degree my life in finance because I always try to look through the jargon and look through all the complicated gesture to get to what is really being said. It, the older you get, it becomes easier in a way to spot it. But it doesn't become the easier in a way to really understand it. That still takes energy. That still takes a certain amount of empathy. And that still takes a real understanding of communication. So to try to finish this up, I want to talk about briefly why I think and why I've thought since I graduated 
from Cornell, that a liberal arts education, one in which your sampling, as my son Peter is now, probably hates me after this speech for even mentioning him, but he's a pretty good guy. And as far as sampling things, so you have an understanding of what different people are learning about, what different people are thinking about, particularly in this world, a certain rigidity is a bad thing. It used to be, well, too much rigidity is a bad thing, but a certain amount of rigidity is good. Now, we stand up and do it. A certain amount of rigidity is not good. A certain amount of empathy is good. And a certain amount of communication is very good. And the communication issue reminded me of when I started to practice, one of the clients we had was a publishing house that just started called Athenaeum Publishing. Obviously, it's no longer, well, it is still there. It's now part of Simon & Schuster, which is now part of God knows. And I had worked on the publishing contract for the firm, the new firm, Athenaeum. And one of their first books that they were going to publish was a book that was going to be called The Double Halix. It was written by two guys, Watson and Crick. And what was it about? It's about some kind of genetics. I don't know what it was about. Anyway, they had written a manuscript. And this guy, Mike Bessie, who was Morris' son-in-law, but was one of the owners of Athenaeum, wanted to publish it. However, they were worried that it might have libelous things in it, in it because it involved other people who had been involved in what seemed to have been the discovery of something called the double helix. So I never took, I took biology three times. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> I've never taken chemistry, a mistake. Never taken physics, a mistake. Which those things should be part of a little while. And I was sitting there with these two geniuses, both of whom were very strange guys. Crick was English, and I could hardly understand him, except I had been to Oxford one summer. I got a scholarship through my advisor, he was a guy named Arch Dotson, who was a professor of government, he was a great guy. He helped me get a scholarship to Oxford, and so I knew a little bit what these people sounded like, but not a lot. And the other guy was this crazy, thin, skinny guy, Watson, who was American but whispered. And I tried to understand the book because I tried to understand what it was I was looking for. And I sat down with them. Crick finally wouldn't talk to me anymore. He was very impatient. And uh, after four months of talking to every day, no, that didn't happen. But Watson talked to me to try to understand what the hell this discovery was. And I finally got some idea of what it was. And I realized what was potentially libelous in it, because once I understood what they were trying to talk about, I could see that. So even though I never really understood that part of genetics and what that discovery meant until much later, I was able to absorb enough of what they were saying to be able to do the job that I was supposed to do. So that is part of a liberal arts education, to keep yourself open so you don't block out communications that are coming at you which seem first to look like giraffes but are really like your pet dog once you get close to them. <laughs> You've seen them before. Okay, my time is up, and I want to leave you with a quote that I first read on a stone wall in 1949 at a place called Cornell University, at a place called Willard Strait Hall. And it's over the arc, the arch when you enter, if you look at it from the inside. And it's in Latin. And what it means, and what it says, more or less, in English is, nothing human is alien to me. 
Nothing human is alien to me. That is the best result of a liberal arts education you can think of. To keep your mind open and your emotions open so that you can absorb what you see around you, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an artist, whatever you are. That is the real benefit of a liberal arts education. And I hope those of you who are in liberal arts can come away with as much of that as I do. do. So I say to you now, all of you, goodbye and good luck. And may the Schwartz be with you. <laughs>